Hello, everyone. Welcome into the Guilty as Charged podcast here on uh, Breakdowns on the Guilty as Charged podcast YouTube channel. I am here with ESPN Insider Field Gates to talk a little bit of Chargers today and everything going into 2023. Field, how, you know, know him from ESPN, you know him from Fantasy Focus, you know him from getting bench pressed by Miles Gabbard, uh, you know him from everywhere. So, Field, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. I would hope that most people know me from being bench pressed by another man on live TV. That, to me, is at least my signature moment during my ESPN career so far. <laughs> yeah, big signature. Feelings on the 23 Chargers here from the people that you talk to. You know, I think the media hype machine made more on the Chargers in 2022 when they made all the big free agency moves. You know, now the Jacksonville game, things are a little bit lukewarm. So just your thoughts uh, on how, you know, are kind of going so far and your expectations for the season yeah i think that uh, you learn a lot about a team when they hit perhaps rock bottom or at least suffer what was by anyone's account a gut-wrenching loss and i think that these things tend to kind of lead you down one of two paths uh, there are teams that reach that point that nadir when they lose in that sort of fashion and it becomes a thing that they look back on as the most important thing that happened to their franchise and then there, I think there are teams that they lose in gut-wrenching fashion and it all kind of crumbles for there. They prove to be a house of cards, whether it's the Falcons and the Super Bowl, maybe the Jaguars and that gut-wrenching AFC championship game that they lost. And they were up by 10 minutes, or excuse me, up by 10 points with eight or so minutes left in the game. Um, you kind of have one of two paths that you go down from there. And for the Chargers, to me, that will kind of be uh, what, what we learn uh, early in the season is – did that Chargers-Jaguars game lead to a team that all of a sudden became mentally tougher or mentally weaker? Um, it's one of those things that's difficult to gauge uh, from the outside looking in. Um, I think it would be disingenuous for me to uh, say that this team can't stay healthy. Uh, but we know that, unfortunately, they've had probably as little luck on the injury front uh, as anybody in the NFL over the past few years to key players. So without sounding like a broken record that's, uh, you know, they, they could talk about the Chargers uh, in, any, in any other capacity. To me, this is a team that on paper has plenty of the right resources to be a factor come playoffs. Um, they just have to, A, stay healthy at some key spots, and then, B, show some sort of uh, competitive spirit uh, to overcome what was a very difficult way to conclude their last uh, playoff season. Yeah, I think you're – I mean, they do have to bounce back from that, obviously have a lot of, you know – storylines to kind of talk about obviously signing Eric Kendricks drafting Quentin Johnson that come into the fold but they are largely right back uh, some of the same team and one of those key players is obviously Justin Herbert um, what did you think when you saw his contract last week um, you know the biggest deal in NFL history until, until Joe Burrow signs uh, but for now it is the biggest deal one of the player friendly no trade clause like Lamar Jackson and Jalen Hurts uh, what did you think when you saw that? Yeah, I'm sort of nonplussed when these quarterback deals come around in this regard is that there are certain quarterbacks that I think are unquestionably worth a long term extension. And once you're in that category, I basically expect that if you are the most recent quarterback to sign one of those deals, that it's also the largest deal ever. So as you mentioned, Justin's deal is the largest in the NFL for now. Joe Burrow's deal probably will come in maybe a half a million dollars per year more, maybe a million dollars per year more, which you know, it's not necessarily that Joe Burrow is unquestionably going to be a better player than Joe uh, Justin Herbert uh, going forward. It's that one of them has been to the Super Bowl, one of them has been to the AFC Championship game twice, and one of them signs later. So once Joe Burrow is done, maybe it's Patrick Mahomes who goes back to the negotiating table. So um, I would say that it was right in line with what the Chargers should be paying Justin Herbert. And I think more than the details, the specifics of the deal – is that when a team has a quarterback under contract, which is now seven more years for the Chargers, baking in the two remaining years on Justin's deal, it just gives you so much more clarity on how you build out the rest of your roster. Not that this was ever a deal that wasn't going to get done, but we've seen, and I'll use the Ravens as the example here, that when your quarterback negotiation takes multiple years, it does have a material impact on how you build the rest of your roster. Up until that Lamar Jackson deal was signed, the Ravens were kicking a ton of money down the line into future years because they were navigating the tightrope of carrying Lamar Jackson's franchise tag value under their cap. 
as opposed to the updated cap number once the extension was agreed to. If you're the Chargers, now that you know for the next seven years what the most significant contract on your books is, it allows you to be smart and be tactical with how you address the rest of the roster. As a matter of fact, I think we kind of saw that with the Chargers when you look at the structure of Justin's deal, which over the first two years, pretty light in terms of cap charges when the team is navigating a tightrope more than they will in future years, right? With Mike and Keenan and Khalil Mack uh, and Joey Bosa all having massive, massive cap hits in 2024, they had to be smart about how they structured Justin's contract so they could avoid the possibility of having to make a lot of difficult decisions right at the same time. Yeah, I, I think that's right. And they structured the deal similarly to Jalen Hurts and doing the option bonuses so they get those reduced cap hits. And that's obviously going to help them build the team as a, you know opposed to Lamar Jackson, who you know was on the franchise tag and went that whole thing before getting his current contract. So I think that that's really important to point out too. On the other end of the contract spectrum, there's also the Austin Eckler situation uh, and what's going on in the running back market right now. So I wanted to get your thoughts on that as well. Um, Eckler actually had a trade request earlier this offseason, then the Chargers gave him some incentives, so now he's back. Uh, and then, you know, he's still been a running back advocate doing meetings on Zoom. Last week, his presser, he said, you know, Saquon Barkley could run for 3,000 yards and the Giants would franchise tag him, right? So he's been a vocal proponent of running backs and kind of anti franchise tag and uh, some of the stuff that running backs are going up against right now. So, uh, what are some of your thoughts on the running back market right now? And I guess, what is a potential solution from here? Uh, so I would say this is that um, I feel for running backs in the sense that they are overtaxed in terms of workload and not compensated on a per touch basis. The essence of this, though, is that teams are not paying you for what you have done. They are paying you for what you will do. And they are balancing that against what they could get if they spent a percentage less. And it's very difficult to... Um, acknowledge the greatness of running backs without also acknowledging that it's proven to be the most fungible position in the league right now. If you look back in recent champions and it's a copycat league, you think about players that were leading rushers or at least prominent parts of a team's backfield during the year in which they won the Super Bowl. The Chiefs last year had a Jarek McKinnon slash Isaiah Pacheco duo that really kind of catalyzed their backfield. McKinnon was playing on a minimum contract. Pacheco was a seventh round pick. Other recent champions have included the Bucks with Leonard Fournette during the year in which he was on a one year contract before he got a much more expensive deal from Tampa Bay. The Chiefs had Damian Williams as their kind of playoff hero when they won their first Super Bowl with Patrick Mahomes. We've seen so many teams that have won big without making significant investments at the running back position. And when you've got 53 players on the active roster, guys on IR, guys that are on practice squads. You've got a lot of cash that you are allocating to players, and you've got to be judicious. And as other positions start to make more and more money, quarterback chief amongst them, but look at the exploding defensive tackle and wide receiver markets, that's going to come at the cost of somebody else because uh, quarterback contracts are growing faster uh, relative to the cap than other positions. Um, and as a result of that, Players like running backs are going to end up being the most vulnerable. I feel for Austin. I think he's an incredible player. As far as solutions go, you know, I've heard a lot of people saying it's time for the running backs to, you know, go back to the negotiating table and sort of upend the CBA. Like, I don't want to sound like a wet blanket. I'd be very surprised, though, if there's any progress whatsoever to try to reform how running backs are paid relative to the CBA. My advice would be this, and it's not what running backs are going to want to hear. And as a matter of fact, it's probably the last thing they want to hear. But um, when a player is coming up for a contract, oftentimes the goal is record-setting deal. Quarterbacks, it's, as we just discussed, that's typically how it goes. For running backs, if I were a drafted running back with pedigree and production on my side, Jonathan Taylor as an example, um, after three years when I am extension eligible, I would talk to my team right away because teams are generally have a greater propensity to pay running backs that are already on their roster and extension eligible as opposed to in free agency. And I don't think I would be looking for record setting money because I'm not so sure that Christian McCaffrey's $16 million per year 
is up for the taking anytime soon with the way that the market is going right now. Uh, I'm sure that Jonathan Taylor wouldn't like to hear this, but if I were him and I could get four years at $14.5 million per year, which brings you to $58 million on an extension, while it would not surpass the money that Christian McCaffrey signed for three off seasons ago. I like that idea a whole lot better than playing it out this year for 4.3 million bucks facing a double tag over the next two years from Indianapolis and every single year having to worry about not just performing, but also staying healthy. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the ability for running backs to potentially not necessarily hit free agency earlier, but be extension eligible certainly earlier could be a big thing uh, for running backs here. And I hope for the best yeah. that it works out for them. I just, I just don't know how realistic that is because I think we yeah. have to sort of be mindful that if that were to happen, and I, I've heard of all the people that have suggested it, make running backs extension eligible after one or two years. Um, what if Patrick Mahomes, or I'll use Justin Herbert, if he, he had, what was it, the most passing yards ever by a rookie or whatever, that you know he had various records that he was setting. Why should he be any less deserving to negotiate a contract after one year than a running back? Right. I mean, who had a more right. material impact on the influence or on, on the output of the Chargers offense in 2021, Justin's rookie season? Right. Like that's the you know, if you set a uh, particular parameter, if you have per particular parameters in place for the running backs only, I think what that's going to lead to is the tight end saying, well, what about us? Right. Or the guard yeah. saying, what about us or the safety? So um, I'm trying to like. While I want to entertain the ideas because I think there is some merit in them, I think that you have to always be mindful of the fact that like the constituency that you are bargaining against, the NFL owners and the league, like they have a lot of ways to push back pretty easily. And I think yeah. there are a lot of players elsewhere that while they're saying the right things publicly, tight ends might say, oh, that's ridiculous. Like if they get that, then why don't we get it as well? Or why don't you know, whoever get it as well, the quarterbacks get it as well, which makes me think that change is probably unlikely to the system. Yeah, absolutely. And then like, the thing that you could talk about with the running backs, if you shave a year or two off of their rookie contract, then their value is going to drop in the draft, right? Because if I can get four years of a contract player at another position versus maybe one or two years or three years of a running back, suddenly, you know, maybe running backs don't go super high in the draft in that regard, uh, considering want to get out rookie contract production and uh, all of those things so i think that's an important point um in this discussion too so until the cba is renegotiated in seven years i don't know what the leverage for running backs is kind of like you said um and uh, yeah other thing that i do want to talk about just as we talk about the uh chargers here um what are the more uh under the radar key point you know storylines that you're following for this team uh, as they go into 2023 Ooh, under the radar. Um, under the radar, that's a good question. Because um, I, I kind of feel like the pivot points, sort of the levers for the Chargers are, now I know that uh, they got sufficient replacement play uh, when Rashawn Slater was not available last year for 14 games in terms of pass protection. But the running game took a pretty dramatic hit. Um, so the offensive line, I think, would be one where uh, you know, the offensive line's health and just like the, the, the composition of the offensive line is certainly something that's going to go a long way in dictating how this team performs. And then I think that the marriage of Kellen Moore and Justin Herbert on paper looks brilliant. And I think the question is, um, does it play out how we all expect it to? They've been saying all the right things and Kellen's a brilliant offensive mind. I think if they are aggressive, which has been something that Kellen has preached throughout the offseason, this team could be absolutely lethal offensively. Justin could lead the NFL in passing yards and passing touchdowns, and it wouldn't surprise me whatsoever. I'm not particularly worried about the offense. Um, I mean, again, it's it, the roster is like rarely a question mark for me uh, with the Chargers. It's, you know, are they available uh, when needed? I suppose um, if I'm looking for an under-the-radar storyline, I'm just trying to think of like, something that hasn't been discussed so many different ways surrounding this team. You know, JC Jackson's health is obviously um, a big one, but also like what kind of player is he, right? I mean, 
he looked from pretty much the minute he stepped on the field last year like a different guy than the Chargers thought they were getting when they gave him that contract for, what, five years and $82.5 right. bucks. Um, that will be one, right, is what version of J.C. Jackson are you getting? Are you getting a guy whose on-ball production was elite for multiple seasons, or are you getting a guy that maybe felt like uh, you know, a, a square peg in a round hole prior to his injury last year? Yeah, and I think that Staley, in, in running his defense like he did with the Rams, say, in 2020, when he had Jalen Ramsey as his like big outside corner, that's uh, locked down defense, right? That's more important to running, I think, what Staley wants to run. So yeah. whether J.C. Jack returns to that level or not um, could probably be a huge determiner of like what the defense is this season. Um, yeah. That's another storyline I guess I want to get to with you because there was a lot of controversy about the Chargers King Staley um, after the way things played out, even though they did improve. Um, what are some of your thoughts, I guess, at this point? Because obviously he's had, you know, pretty bad defense in these first two seasons. Um, yeah. The defense as a whole just hasn't come together yet. A lot of been injuries. Um, but where's kind of your confidence meter in Brandon Staley as head coach right now? Yeah, so I might be sort of like the uh, the guy that thinks of things a little bit differently the most um, in the sense that one thing I admire about Brandon Staley is that he has a plan that he tries to execute. Not every plan is going to work, um, but his, I think it's pretty simple um, as to why Brandon Staley generates so much conversation. He does things slightly unconventionally. And I'm talking specifically about his aggression on fourth down. Mm -hmm. That's not like normal for football fans to see a coach approach the game that way. Um, I think about like the sport of golf and I think about like when things change in a slight manner, whether right. it's like, you know, putter size or length or, you know, whether golf balls need to be adjusted, no matter what the change is, it just disrupts the ecosystem so much that people get really mad. Right. Um, and that's what Brandon Staley represents with going forward on fourth down is that forever we've known that like, you kind of go for it on fourth down if it's like fourth and one and you're on the opposing team's 32-yard line and it's maybe a little windy out. You don't want to kick a long field goal and risk them getting the ball at the 42-yard line going the other way, right? But when it's whatever, fourth and two from your own 17-yard line in the first quarter in a 3-3 game, you punt the ball. That's what you're supposed right. to do. So um, I admire that Brandon Staley has a plan that he follows through with. Is it going to incur some risk that others are unwilling to take? Of course it is, um, but it also is going to incur some advantages that others are unwilling to tap into, uh, multiple possessions that you may not get, or the idea that um, there's obviously an analytical component to this, but if you go for it on fourth down and like successfully convert, it's going to create like a bit of a mental edge that I think your opponent's going to have to deal with for the rest of that drive or potentially for the rest of that half or game. So. I kind of like that he is who he is and he's authentically himself. Um, I know Brandon a little bit, don't know him a ton, um, but I've always felt like when we've had conversations at the combine that what you see is what you get. And I think I'd rather like have a plan and sync with that plan than have somebody who's going to succumb to the pressures of what others might do in that same situation. I thought it would have been kind of crazy to fire him uh, despite the ending last season uh, in the playoffs. Um, but I acknowledge that this is a league where patience runs really thin amongst ownership groups. So mm -hmm. I'm stating the obvious when I say that he's one of many coaches that are under a certain amount of pressure this year, because that's just how the business works. There are just a lot of coaches who are very, very good that because the NFL in some way stands for not for long are going to have to succeed this year or in December, people are going to be saying is fill in the blank coach safe. Right, yeah, and, and I think that Staley also as a defensive play caller, right, like yeah. when he's on, despite, you know, what the lack of resources might be in terms of injury and all these things, we saw what he did uh, against Mike McDaniel's red-hot Dolphins offense last year yeah. coming into the big game, and that was a big spot for him, or the, or the Niners game, where he just has these great performances, probably boosts the Chargers' value in games that maybe they even shouldn't have been in, um, but obviously he brings value on the defensive side of the ball as well, which maybe gets lost in some of these other conversations about the Chargers 2022 offense or, or some of these other things. Um, I guess I'll ask you, how are you feeling just record 
prediction, guys. If I have to put on the spot, it is August. It is time for <laughs> record prediction time. Yeah. Uh, what do you kind of think about the Chargers this year? And if you had to predict kind of where they finish in the playoffs, outside of the playoffs, uh, what are you feeling? I think they're a playoff team. I know they play Miami in week one. I got to look at the rest of the schedule, though, to sort of do my forecast. They, they strike me as like a 10 to 12 win team. I'll call it 9 to 12 because, um, you know, there are some things that they have to prove. Um, that I think um, until they prove them, you know, I, I used to always say this, like, and it's hard to get experience until you have experience um, I, for the chargers. Like it's hard for me to know that you've overcome some of your demons until you've overcome some of your demons. Does that make sense? Um, so I think they're like a nine to 12 win team. Uh, the AFC is just a gauntlet this year, but I do think they're the second best team in their division. And uh, if you can take care of business against, both Denver and also Las Vegas, then I think you're uh, in a pretty good spot here. Yeah, and you can, the Chargers have always made the Chiefs tough. It's just unfortunately been the end of games that's kind of been their undoing recently. Travis yep. Kelsey catching some touchdown or something happening uh, at the end of an overtime that ends up being their kind of, you know, bad stuff there. But overall, they've always played them tough. It's all been close games. And if you can get a split with the Chiefs, right, you can kind of like talk yourselves into them being a division contender. Um, totally. But yeah, got to beat them uh, first. I just looked most. it up. They play the Chiefs in week 18. So, you know, that could be a game that if the Chiefs yeah. already have wrapped up, could be like, uh, I mean, or uh, the Chargers, by the way, could be in a really good playoff right. spot. So I do like the idea well, of getting the Chiefs in week 18. Yeah, the, the Chiefs week 18 game is interesting. It puts, I think, a lot more pressure because they also play them in week seven. Um, okay. So that puts almost a lot more pressure on that game. Right, mm, more so than sure. like the average game, because you may not get a chance to get back at the Chiefs if they're if they're resting, or maybe there is something to play for in some Week 18 AM well West said. scenario. Yeah, hmm? well said. Uh, yeah, we saw that with the Raiders a couple of years ago. Unfortunately, yeah. it did, didn't go the way that me or other Chargers fans uh, would have wanted. Um, so, uh, Field, I guess I'll get you out on this one word to describe the 2023 chargers uh if we're talking at the end of the year what do you think that one word would be explosive explosive, explosive because they are explosive on both sides of the ball they've got what i would call field flipping players on defense sack artists turnover machines in the back end derwin james by himself and then on offense while they've got a guy in keenan allen who's never going to be confused for like a speed burner um they've got difference makers in the vertical passing game on the perimeter uh, Quinton Johnston should help them out a ton in that regard. And I think you kind of know what you're getting when you sign up for him. Um, you draft him in the first round. Uh, really good after the catch. Um, I know everybody's been talking about the hands. Um, my evaluation was that there's a bit of a mental part. It's a, con it's a, it's a consistency thing. It's uh, a belief that um, you're strong enough to play through the catch. Um, it's different, too, when you're in the Big 12 and – you're bigger, faster, and stronger, and you can allow the ball to come to your body. Uh, I try to be judicious with um, how much I put into the various training camp reports. Um, right. there, it sounds like there's been some days where drops have been more of a problem than others, but uh, I think it's overcomable. I think he's a really good player with the ball in his hands, which you don't find too many guys at six foot four and 225 pounds who run in the open field quite like he does. Yeah, and I think it's just about getting that ceiling player, right? Because you, see if you took the player, I think it was Mina Kimes, who said, if you took the player before and after the catch, <laughs> that guy awesome. He's, you know, be a potential Hall of Fame receiver. It's totally. the part in the middle that needs fixing. So I, on a ceiling perspective, I think that's why the Chargers and, and other teams were interested in him in the draft and ultimately why they ended up taking him. So, uh, Field, thanks for coming on the show. Uh, and uh, can I get up from you? Bolt up, baby. Let's go. <laughs> Bolt up, everybody, and see you guys next time.